Welcome to the Sorch Podcast, where we explore Sikh and wider South Asian history, art and philosophy with historians, artists and researchers. Today, I get to talk to Simran Kaur, who is currently doing an MA in traditional art, and Satnam Singh, who is a published author on Sikh history about traditional art, Sikhi and representation. First of all, thank you, Simran, for making the time. And also thank you, Satnam, for making the time to do this podcast. It's the second that I get the pleasure of doing with Satnam. And it's the first one that we've actually had a woman on the podcast. More importantly, this is one of the first podcasts we've had about art and then in relation to Sikhi as well. So I'm really excited to, to get into this. So first of all, Simran, if we could start with yourself, if you could just give us a little bit of a background about who you are, where you're from. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty young. I'm only 22. That's really young. Trust me, that's really young. Yeah, I'm really I'm really young. Yeah, when you when I literally just turned 22 about a couple of days. Oh ago, well, happy but... belated birthday. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so I'm pretty young. So most of my interest in art kind of came from school and being. Uh, I was I was very academic. I went into the sciences a lot and I was edged into kind of becoming a doctor, becoming one of those ones. And it, it just didn't do anything for me. I, did, I, I couldn't focus. I couldn't think straight. And then I started painting. And it was just like tiny little things. I used to paint in oil and I used to paint small portraits. And I kind of just went from there. I mean, I grew I was not born here. I was born in Africa. So I'm Kenyan. Um, I could have guessed with a second name like Benissa. I... It's a Kenyan surname, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a very Kenyan surname. Yeah, so we're, I'm assuming that your parents obviously then, was it your parents or grandparents that moved to Kenya then? Um, great-grandparents. So my oh, great-grandfathers wow. on both sides came from Punjab to build the railways. Yeah. Um, in Kenya, I think it's between Uganda and Kenya. So they bit, um, they came over to do that and so we migrated the whole family over and then that's um, mad yeah and then three generations of my family were born in africa and then uh, my mum and all of us were moved over here so your family didn't move then during the 70s when Idi Amin started to kick everyone out of uganda because that's how my family ended up in england again similar similar uh history in that they went from india to Kenya to build the railways and then Idi Amin obviously went a bit bonkers in Uganda and then they left. So yeah. so I take it your family then obviously stayed behind. Yeah. Um in uh, with with my Ugandan family it was mostly on my mom's side and they try, uh, they moved over from Uganda to Kenya and then they kind of stayed there and so we we just stayed in Africa really. Most of us are still so my grandparents are still there. Um part of my family is still there and then most of us kind of migrated to England. It's kind of, it's, How old were you uh, when you moved to England? Sorry. I, know, of course. <laughs> I, I was five. I was only five when I moved over. Oh, okay. So then, like, do you remember much of the language and the culture and stuff like that? Um, I'm able to understand bits of Swahili because um, it was my first language. I learned Swahili and then I learned English and then I learned Punjabi. So it was, um, I do understand bits and phrases and things, but I guess when we moved over here and no one spoke it over here, it was just, it kind of went out of my head. And now I just know English and bits of Punjabi. So do you... Punjabi is really bad. So is yeah, well, yeah, I can, I, I'm not one to, to, to sing my Punjabi. <laughs> is great but um are you one of those people who have like random swahili words in their punjabi so like for argument's sake um i remember asking for a kisu and everyone looked at me in the gudora like what are like what are you they're like yeah what are you doing i went up to it i went into the group and i was like oh what burger is this now what's, what's burger like, oh, oh sabzi, sabzi, yeah yeah sabzi. and i never knew that until like interacting with like it's weird, isn't it? But like, it's like, I never knew that. Kisu, uh, what's the other one? I call a, I call onions gunde. And people are like, what are gunde? And I'm like... They say gutte, don't they? Yeah, we say... Yeah, gunde. and I'm, I'm like, what's a gutta? Gutta sounds wrong, man. <laughs> like, what? Um, but yeah, sorry, we, we, we digress. So your interest in art, was that just something that just kind of came about? Or was it connected to your personal journey of Sikhi? Like, how did those two meet in your world? So I, I feel like I've always been exposed to some form of art. My my granddad is a very avid, well, he is a very avid photographer. He doesn't take any more photographs now, he's gotten quite old. But he was a very avid photographer. And then he used to also do a lot of calligraphy. And he used to like, 
draw these pictures of birds with with his ink and his pen and I used to always grow up looking at them and then when I moved over here I'm I'm related to a, a couple of artists so I grew up with with them around as well and seeing their work and so it was just being able to connect all these different things that pushed me towards the arts rather than a, a more kind of academic way of um, life I guess. No, fair enough. I, I have to admit, I was in a very similar situation. I have an older brother and a younger brother who are extremely strong in their sciences and math. And so, again, the, the impetus for the family was, again, concentrate on the, on the maths and the sciences and like go into those kind of traditional professions. But yeah, I guess I was kind of lucky to have someone who was understanding. And I was like, I want to do a history degree. And everyone was like, what are you going to do with that? Um, and to be fair, they were right. I haven't done anything with that degree. But uh, I think the, the personal understanding you get from from an arts degree and that development that you have as a person is just unmatched i don't think you yeah, com- completely 100 percent. and it's very reflective almost of your journey so I, I read some of my work that i've done like maybe even five six seven years ago and i'm like i disagree with everything i've said in that and that's just because of where you are as a person changes obviously over time so did you always know at like a particular point i want to be an artist or did it just kind of happen when I was when I was doing my A levels, I I used to visit the VNA a lot, and I used to kind of think about what it would be like to work in the basements and and restoring everything. And I really wanted to go into restoration, and so that's why that's when I decided oh, I'll take an art degree and then see where I can go. And like when I do take my masters, see where I can go with that. So it was kind of like it started with restoration, and now with what I've been learning within my masters and like the kind of ethos and everything that they teach us there I've moved it I've, I've moved away from restoration and more into teaching and pushing pushing traditional arts out into the world so it's it's changed but it's it's all kind of hand in hand really because traditional arts does require some form of restoration and being able to bring back things that are obviously dying yeah well I was just actually gonna say I was like surely in learning the traditional arts you're actually giving more people the ability to restore like old artifacts or paintings or whatever um i can't remember i think maybe a couple of months ago there was a viral image of a statue in spain that was trending on twitter of uh, it had been restored it had been restored really poorly um and it looked like oh yeah i think i know what you're talking about uh, yeah, yeah. and i just remembered it when we're talking about restoration because i think knowing the right art or the skill to restore that item back to its original state is actually it's, it's a science it's a skill it's something that's quite difficult and and to be i'll be completely honest i actually didn't have any concept of what traditional arts were until we discussed this podcast and then i've been on a bit of a journey researching and reading and i've been like wow actually this is a completely different way of looking at things so for argument's sake and again we'll get into this further on in the podcast but stuff like how Sikh history Sakis Rag Kirtan uh, Shastad Vidya all of these different traditional arts how they fit into the community and, I, and yeah so thank you obviously for 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 being the the spark to that um just moving further then into kind of getting to, to know you a little bit more. So art is obviously something that you're passionate about and it's something that you're t- obviously uh, diving into in a lot of detail. Along that journey, who has been perhaps someone who has inspired you or, I don't know, given you kind of a, a bit of advice that you've, you've never forgotten? Um, so I, I grew up around Jatinder Dehede, so he's, he's, he's very close family. I've known him since I was very young. And um, just watching him work, I've been in his studio a couple of times and he kind of, he introduced me to the Prince's School and he was the one who kind of pushed me forward and he was like, you know, if you want to do it, do it. And always kept, um, he'd always message about different things he'd find out or explain different techniques to me or just a simple thing or draw, dropping off paper to my house that was, I, I couldn't, you can't buy in this country. So little things like that kind of pushed me towards the traditional arts and I think he was one of the big pillars that, that was able to um, create this journey for me, really, and help me to figure out what I want to do and where I want to be. No, I respect that. I respect that. I have to admit, I've... That's beautiful. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's, it's probably one of the most heartfelt stories that I've come across during this little podcast series that we've done so far. And I have to admit, I, I don't know Jatinda personally, and I've, I've, I've seen his art for years, and he's a remarkable artist. So, yeah, I think it's amazing that he is lighting like your candle so to speak and, and helping your journey um and it's 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 brilliant to see that okay just continuing then on that kind of train of thought in relation to 
this time into a book or perhaps something that you've read? Is there anything that you perhaps ha- haven't forgotten about kind of along your journey? I would I would say that there was I I wouldn't say it was a book. It was uh, most of my most of my kind of memories and everything linked to experiences that I've had recently. So I I usually I'm trying to train in um, traditional painting, like miniature painting, Persian miniature. So this I I had an icon painting class in uni, and it's something I've never done before. Something I've never kind of looked into. I've not really looked into icon- iconography and egg tempera painting. And there was a moment within that class where the teacher she we were all socially distancing, and she was sitting by the window. And to gild a piece of gold onto a wooden base you'd have to put down a clay mixture and then breathe onto the mixture and the gold would stick on it and that would last for centuries I had no idea about that and she uh, sat there and she breathed onto the clay and as she breathed there was like a beam of light that came through the stained glass window in our studio and it illuminated the gold as she placed it onto the um onto the wood and I'll never be able to forget that kind of memory and it, it really instilled this idea of how closely linked traditional arts is to spirituality and God. Like just to understand it through different traditions that we have no idea about. I mean, I didn't grow up anything about iconography. First of all, I just have to say, I, I'm, you're completely the right person to have this podcast with. But no, you're right in the sense of that we have no idea, actually. We're completely detached from what traditional arts are are and how they relate to pretty much everything around us so just like a personal anecdote i didn't realize the extent of the artwork and the hard manual labor that went into beautifying Kalamandar Saib. And I only read a couple of pages of a book that like I was I, I happen to have. So I can imagine the journey that you're having doing a master's degree in traditional arts and then obviously also kind of relating that to your own personal kind of Sikhi journey. Um what do you think then as an artist is the most valuable or the kind of the the key characteristic that you need to have I, I was thinking about this a lot actually recently I, there's a couple of things that I feel go hand in hand so I, um one of them is definitely humility and being able to submit to your craft I was um when I did my miniature painting course with um Susanna Marine she uh, explained all these different techniques and I thought I knew everything because I didn't what I've d- I did one before and I was my ego was through the roof and I was like yeah you know what I'm not I know what I'm doing everything's great and I messed up the painting it took a while to, and it, it really it hit me really badly and it took a while to kind of calm down and be like you know what th- just think about what needs to be done and the biggest lesson I learned from that that one experience was being able to understand that these crafts aren't something that you can just like wing this is something that you have to sit down and understand that they have their own characteristics, they have their own um, needs. And if you don't meet those needs, the painting won't manifest. So being able to submit to that craft and understand that you and yourself are just a vessel between heaven and earth and whatever God is passing through you through that craft will manifest only if you listen to those needs. So that was, I think, a very important thing that I feel like every artist should have within them. And then this idea of oneness and being truly understanding of who you are on the inside as well as the outside and being able to, like everything that you do literally like comes from your soul. And in traditional arts, especially within alchemy, within painting, within um, carving, everything comes from within. To be able to understand who you are inside as well as outside is very, very important. And then just all together, this idea of detachment I was with my Persian miniature teacher and she spoke about how each painting, as you're painting, it should matter. And once it's finished, it, it has no place in your life anymore. It's that process where you start the painting, you make the paints, you make the pigments, you make the paper and then take it through that whole journey of creation. That's what matters to you. And then you detach from your work and it doesn't matter at all. I think these three kind of qualities are very important for an artist. What you've said is absolutely awesome. There's three things in particular that I just want to pick up on. First of all, the first part where you're talking about being the vessel and and being present and letting it flow, you've essentially summarized. uh, There's a book by Arvind Mandir called Sikhism for the Perplexed. And what it does is it explains Sikhi without this colonial perspective. So it, it pretty much puts Sikh philosophy in an English book without 
kind of Christianizing it. And you've essentially summarized that. In terms of the, the, the semantics, we can get nitpicky about words like soul and God, but for the sake of this podcast, we don't need to. And in relation to then what your Persian art teacher was saying in relation to kind of the art being the process, I'm sure you're more aware of it than I am, but uh, the tradition of making mandalas and then like p- putting all that time and effort into making these beautiful colored patterns on the floor and then just rubbing it out. And it's a parallel or it's an analogy of life because actually you spend all this time doing all of this and in the end you die. And and I know it sounds quite somber and a bit morbid, but actually that's the reality, right? It's, it's brilliant to hear such eloquence put into actually what it is that you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. So proverbial hats off to you. So how do you stay ahead or like, what is it that you do to make sure you've got your finger on the pulse? As an artist and a traditional artist, you should always be in a constant state of learning. So you're always going to be a student. There's always going to be someone out there that's going to know more than you. So you should always strive to do the best you can within your own knowledge and continue learning, continue that video and, and, and just keep keep basically just keep yourself learning and keep yourself um, accessing all this information. And then as you keep doing that, it reflects within your work like uh, i know a small group of traditional artists like we've, we we speak about different things and you build this community together and then it ends up being that one person turns around and they're like oh you want do you want to do a commission together or do you want to work on a collaboration together and then you bring all these different things together and that teaches you even more so you're constantly learning and you're constantly bringing things out into the world and i don't think there's like a rat race with traditional arts that I feel that there is with contemporary art like I feel like with traditional arts you have that pace to be able to understand you as well as understand the work but with contemporary arts it's very commercialized everything I want to put this in my living room I want to put this in my bedroom or something like that so traditional arts I feel like if you're a if you're a practicing artist and you truly understand what you're doing and why these things are done a certain way you're able to step back from everything and kind of connect to something higher and keep working in that way for the rest of your life. So it, it, it's it's a weird one because you, you'd think that you'd be um, competing with loads of people and have loads of competition, but I don't see that in the traditional arts at all. I think everyone's very comfortable to call each other family and help each other out. So that's what I've experienced at least. Well, to be fair, from what you've said, that experience that you've had actually seems to be what you've also brought into this podcast in terms of it feels like we're just three friends just having a conversation. Um, So I can well imagine that that's the environment that you're also working within. All right. This last question, I think, is probably the biggest one and is going to help lead into the, the second part, which I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to, which is traditional arts in relation to Siki. But first of all, if you could perhaps define what traditional art is for those listening. And then secondly, why do you think traditional art is important? And like some of the questions I might put forward to you, it's just me being the devil's advocate. So for argument's sake, is there even a need for traditional art? Surely we can do the same thing with a printer. So I've never really sat down and defined traditional arts. I mean, I feel like you can't really put it in a bubble, but um, traditional arts kind of looks into... um, arts before I guess arts before the industrial age and before then and like looks into everything where everything was hand ground everything was done by hand uh looking into skill looking into um generational art that was passed down things things like that I mean I I don't know how to put it into a box it's so it's so big and so wide evident to be honest, the, the definition that I had found on the internet, again, w- was essentially what you had just said. Um, it was that it w- it was an art that's learned from person to person and passed from generation to the next. I actually never knew anything about traditional art. Like I've read about Sikh art and Sikh history, never quite seen it in that framework of traditional art. But I think it makes perfect sense when you do. But just putting that to a side for a second, why do you why did you think it was important enough to do a master's in traditional art? I think is probably the easiest way of asking this question. Um, so with with traditional arts, I mean, first, like the reason why I kind of went into it was I've never been able to find my ground. I think it's because of just having such a mixed background of like first being from Punjab and then moving to Kenya and then moving to England. It's been it's been a lot, and you don't really know where your feet stand. And traditional arts so far have been helping me to pick up those strings again and find those roots and go back to 
the life of our people and the Sikh Empire pre-colonization because I feel like that's when we strive the most and we were able to find power and find all of these different art forms that established the people that we are and the people that we were so traditional arts can I got into that during my um, my BA and everyone was doing contemporary art and I was the one person who straight away and did uh, started learning traditional work but definitely I think traditional art is very important to firstly understand history but there's this deep primordial philosophy within traditional art that it is really important for both human um, development and human like soul development as well I think with traditional arts we're always in a state of remembrance like this stuff is already known to us known to our souls that like, we don't know how old we are and it's very, like the same philosophy uh, res- uh, the same philosophy relates to Sikhi as well and um, we're always in a constant state of remembrance that we through through practicing and through doing all of these things you link back to all these lifetimes that you could have lived before and um, my alchemy teacher David Kronzuk talks about this a lot and he's always on about how grinding in a certain way grinding a pigment towards the right is like the movement of creation and all of these different things like even holding a brush in a certain way or shading in a certain way all links to all these different meditative um, aspects that help to make your spiritual life a lot deeper, I guess, if that's the way. It helps you to grow your spiritual life. Well, just something that your that your professor Kranswick reminds me of is, is that him talking about grinding in a particular way is so you'll notice when you go to Harmanda Sahib, a lot of people do that Pakarma clockwise. However, you'll notice if you have the luck to, if there's any Nahangs around, they'll go the opposite way. And that's again related to that, which is actually we're bit a guard, they're beyond time, so they go counterclockwise. And I think another thing that jumps out to me, especially when you're talking in some of the, the very limited research I did for this podcast in relation to traditional a lot is is that it seems to be universal so a lot of the concepts a lot of the understanding it's the same thing pretty much wherever you look although it might come to materialize in a different way and and i think you're you're right in that it, it does connect on a deeper way but i think that's also related to traditional art being like a discipline like there's a lot more like for argument's sake, you have to have to, you have to go and get the knowledge and the skill to learn how to make that color, and you might have to go and get a particular plant and grind it in a particular. Like it's so much more arduous and long-winded than obviously like more modern um, techniques are. So this now nicely brings us to the second part, which is traditional art and Sikhi. Now. I will be completely frank. I didn't really understand what traditional art was until, well, until you suggested the the topic. Just going back a little bit to the question about why traditional art is so important. So there's just three small examples that that I was reading about during some of this research, research, which I think are important to share to help just contextualize some of the conversation as we move forward. Although they're not related to Sikh history, I think it should help. So this is an interesting one. So for argument's sake, um, if anyone's familiar with the World's Fair, what essentially it doesn't really hold any importance anymore, but um, it essentially was a showcase of countries and their latest development. So you'd go and show off your tourist capacity or you'd go and show off, I don't know, the latest technology that your country had developed or whatever it was. And I was reading that Liberia, when they were asked to join the World's Fair in 1984 and 1926 and 1901, instead of sending anyone, I don't know, to showcase their tourist capacity, they sent traditional dancers. And again, obviously, it shows how important traditional art was to them. Another example, and I think in this situation, it goes to show how traditional art can be really important in resurrecting a community. And I think this it will have a lot to tie into Sikh history and Sikh art in particular. But there is a Solomon Island, uh, a very small island, sorry, in the Solomon Islands um, that have a very distinct small indigenous community. And they live in a place called East Wayo. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Cutting a long story short, they set up a cultural center there and all it taught its subjects was traditional dancing, music, traditional ways of constructing houses, crafts, oral history, how to have a garden, traditional things for that 
community. Not only did that lead to a revival in the traditional arts in that area, but it also resurrected certain dead crafts. So certain things that these people were going to the museum and seeing as their ancestors, I don't know, antique ornament or something, they now had the skills and the knowledge to be able to reproduce that. On top of that, it also gave birth to a small little industry that supported them because obviously they could now sell this to art dealers, museums or or, or whatever. The interesting thing that came out of that, and obviously we'll, we'll dig into this later on in the podcast, it was a university that helped kickstart this revival of traditional arts. Now, for me, I felt slightly uneasy because I think at some there's got to be some boundary or distinction between helping an indigenous indigenous community and then almost kind of like profiting off them. Again, we we'll, we can delve into this a little bit uh, deeper when we move on. The last example then is, I think, probably something that a lot of people will be able to very in, just intrinsically connect to. So whenever we say, I know it's a random example, but whenever we say hula hoop dancing, we always think of this like random, traditional, stereotypical Hawaiian lady doing her little dance or whatever, right? But actually, when you read into it, hula and hula is actually a traditional dance for Hawaii. And it is so far from this superficial understanding that we have in in a Western world. And this relates back to the second example, because modernity has given us a particular idea of what hula dancing is in, in, in this instance. And it's completely detached it and removed it from the people, the traditions, and everything else that goes with it. And in a similar way, I think a lot of sea art can almost, you can almost take an analogy from that, which is like, so for argument's sake, I wasn't really aware, like Sikh art, like what is that? Like my concept has been very, very superficial in that. As far as I was concerned, the only Sikh art that we had was people like Sobha Singh, very modern, very recent. I never knew anything beyond that. But actually when you keep digging, it turns out that it's a whole lot deeper and a whole lot wider. So for argument's sake, just talking about some of the techniques used to beautify her Mandasai, the amount of care and attention taken is absolutely nuts. So with that all in mind and helping to contextualize it, what I would like to start with then is what are we referring to when we're talking about Sikh art? So the two definitions that I found, one was from Susan Strong, who published The Arts of the Sikh Kingdoms, I think. And she essentially says that there's no rigid, con- there's no rigid restrictions. When it comes to Sikh art, there isn't kind of any framework. There's no set standard. There's nothing, so to speak, that needs to be incorporated to make it Sikh art. I think the only thing that I could spot was either the person painting it or the person in the painting, one of the two was Sikh or, or had some connection to Sikh. The second definition then comes from W.G. Archer, who was probably one of the earlier people to look into Sikh paintings. Um, And he says that Sikh art doesn't really come to fruition until about 1810. And that's when we see the first approach by Hill artists to Sikh patrons and the first expression of interest in painting by Sikhs themselves. Now, obviously, I've got a limited understanding of it. So Satnam and Simran, if you could both add what you perhaps think is the definition of Sikh art, and then we can continue from there. Yes, I'll try my best to answer those uh, questions. First, I'd like, just like to thank Simran for um, giving us insight into her well studies, but also like the way that she approaches uh, Sikh art. It's very humbling. It's very, um, like Ahmed also said, it's very inspiring to hear this. Um, this, this in, in the, in, what do you say, like in a live session, so to speak? Because like people like me and Ahmed, we're into history. Our main focus is actually in trying to understand the history of our elders and, and the past and trying to make sense of the history that's written uh, in books and, and so forth but that's like all we do whereas people like you painters poets and so forth what you're doing is actually you're creating history because you're 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 building something that will be in 200 years time will be talked about just like in this podcast we will talk about the paintings of the past that were made in the time of Maharaja and Deen. so I always find it very inspirational very humbling to be in the presence of yeah poets teachers painters and so forth because I consider that uh, as much more important because you're actually creating history rather than just analyzing it like people like me and Amr are, are doing so I just want to thank you for that it's also because she's bringing this, you can say, this very traditional approach into it. Um, you talk a lot about devotion, humility, piety, spirituality. Like one thing we have to remember is that 
art is not just art. It's not like something you buy from a from an auction house. You go home and you put it on your wall. That's not art necessarily from a traditional perspective. Because like everything you mentioned, there's a lot of devotion that goes into it. It's a part of a spiritual practice. It's an extension, really, of a spiritual practice. I remember reading a. It was a Nirmala commentary of an old uh, Sanskrit book. Um, so, so like the, the author, the Nirmala Sikh author was translating. And then at the same time, he was giving his own views on it. And he wrote something really important. Um, so I think the, the, the verses were talking about yoga. And then he was trying to explain what is meant by this. And then he says, giving his own example, he says, there are different kinds of, uh, there are different ways of uh, you can do yoga, you can do meditation of the mind. And he says, writing poetry is one form of, of yoga. I, re- I remember like he's saying that from, it was very beautiful uh, when I read it the first time because we often think that yoga is just like stretching your body and doing all these things, but he's actually taking yoga to a different level saying writing poetry, painting, and that's a form of meditation. That's a form of yoga. And the examples that you gave with your teacher um, when you talked about detachment just brought me straight back into that uh, mindset of the Nirmala. And also, like, it's very important also, just want to add in, I was, I was sitting here taking notes while you were talking, I found it very inspirational. Um, and it's, it's also this idea of ego, uh, you touched upon it a little bit. From a traditional perspective, uh, there's a book that was written at the time of the Sikh empire that gives a really beautiful analogy. And it says that some people, they will read a scripture and it will humble them. They, they will be so humbled by looking or reading this particular scripture. Then other people, they will read the same scripture and all it does to them, is it increases their ego. It increases their, their anger. Like, I've read this book. I know so much. I know this. I know that. And then they're going to go into the streets and there people using their knowledge to basically slam things with it. And the funny thing is that these guys have read the same book. But one turned out to become more humbled and the other became more arrogant from the same, from reading basically the same, same book. And I think this is a very interesting, interesting concept that you see over and over again in, in Sikh history. This idea that humbleness has always has to be attached to the kind of uh, devotional uh, practice that you're engaging in. You see it even in the time of the Anandpur Darbar, some of the poets they, their egos got increased because they thought they were so good at writing poetry in a specific meter, specific rhyme and so forth. So the guru had to step in and basically put them in their place. Because again, these things, art is not just art. It's not, it doesn't just have to be beautiful. At, at the end of it, the process of getting to that beautiful painting has to be one of devotion as well. So I just want to thank you for before we venture into the historical uh, part. So this this is also the, the answer to some of the questions we were discussing before, at least the way I see it. Like, what is traditional art? One of the main definitions is that it's something that's passed on through the generation from father to son, from father to daughter, father to mother to daughter, and so forth. Um, it is a way of conditioning the mind into a specific form of art, because we could all have a universal mindset and just appreciate all art. It doesn't matter if it's from South America, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe. But the question is, will we invest in it? And can we even invest in all forms of art? And I think this is where traditional art is very important because it becomes something that's more specific, that links us with a history that's our own. And it is the reason that we wish to spend our time, our energy, and so forth. And is it even possible, right? What traditional art does is that it, it, it kind of connects us, like you say, with our ancestors. And it, it, it kind of gives us an identity that's more secure than just having this universal identity. And this means that it may be possible for us to invest our time, our money, uh, and our discussions and so forth into this particular form of, of, of art because it's specific to us and it's not specific to your Gora neighbor. Uh, and this is what, again, brings us together as a community. Sorry, couldn't like, so again, just being complete devil's advocate here, couldn't you separate the art from the tradition in that, in, in a sense? So what I mean by that is, for argument's sake right now, that Mahalla 9 calendar, taking that as an example, for me, I think in a hundred years time, people will look back at that calendar and other items of art that have been produced by the Sikh community in the diaspora, and they will be studied in a similar way to how perhaps we look back at historical images and take understandings from them, right? 
but the, the, the historical significance of both of the images are equal, so to speak. However, the difference is the methods for argument's sake gone into them. So old school art, obviously they don't have modern printers, so they weren't printing these the, these calendars out. But the old school art is using a, is a, using a traditional method. And actually the, the connection in traditional art isn't the art itself. It's the processes and the methods that go into it, if that makes sense. Uh, that could possibly be a, a good way of looking at it. But I also think one of the um, key factors here is that it's not necessarily the methods that's the important thing here in traditional art. It is the process that went and, and the labor of love that went into it. And I think you and I and us in this conversation, we will we will look at painting and we will relate to it in a completely different way than say your Gora neighbor or some some guy 200 years from now who's not a part of this tradition because we understand the sacrifices and and, and someone just from the outside of this tradition i don't think they will be able to understand it so they will probably look at it as 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 form of aesthetics like it's so beautiful the colors the and so forth um, whereas we will look at it and add a soul into this so it will have more life you can say for us rather than for others that's just my opinion i might exaggerate a bit but i hope you got the point no, no, I, I don't, I don't disagree. I, yeah, I, I, and this is just the beauty of these conversations, which is we're just throwing our thoughts about, and so like for argument's sake, it is literally just working towards some type of kind of discernible conclusion. But no, fair enough. Just, just bringing then Simran into the conversation in relation to seek art or traditional seek art. How would you go about defining that if, if you can? Um. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to say that Sikha is definable purely because it's so integrated in so many different traditions like Persian traditions, Mughlai painting, uh Bahari painting. Like it's it's so integrated in everything. But I think like you, you mentioned earlier on about the context and the artist being Sikh, that would somewhat be able to define a piece of work as Sikh art. I mean, you could, I know a lot of people say that the marble inlays at Hermanda Saib are Sikh, but when I was looking into them and I was, I was really looking into the geometry and the the patterns and the, the flowers and the florals and everything, they were very, very reminiscent to Persian paintings. There were loads of cypress trees, there were loads of pomegranates, loads of grapevines, and you kind of think of how everything is so interconnected. So I wouldn't say that Sikh art is very definable. I do agree with what you said earlier on about the context and the artist being Sikh for it to be a Sikh piece of work. Yeah, just, I guess, to add further context to that, in hindsight, I actually kind of gave you a trick question because I think if we're if we're really honest I think the so from a historical perspective and I know people listening to this podcast are probably sick of me repeating this but there's a great book by a guy called Harjo Oberai called Demarcation or Construction of Religious Boundaries or something and in a sense what you've done is actually paraphrased his book uh, which pretty much argues that the Sikh religion in a post Singh Sabha or, or kind of thanks to the Singh Sabha movement demarcated itself or constructed its Self as a unique identity with various rituals. So, for argument's sake, a non's garage, um, baby naming ceremony, and thumb some scar ceremony, all of these different things. And equally, then another really easy way of bringing this, I wouldn't say tension, but obviously in a modern uh, in the modern sense, we have this preconceived idea of what Sikh is, and we use that to look at history, and we look at history backwards. So we always assume that this concept of Sikh is what's been there since day one. And actually, what once you kind of keep digging, you find out that that's not the case. So for argument's sake, give you two really easy examples. Javala had posted a quote from Gaur Singh's, I can't remember the text now, but it's from Gaur Singh. And, and, he, and it's a quote about how Gaur Gobind Singh Ji will look after the farmers. And obviously he's posting it in relation to what's going on in Delhi. Um, and I saw people arguing over it and being like, oh no, the guy who wrote it is Hindu. No, the guy who wrote it is Sikh. And actually that argument if you ask the guy who wrote it at the time whether he was Sikh or Hindu, he probably wouldn't been able to answer you in a definitive sense because those those terms and their definitions have been constructed over a few hundred years and thanks to numerous influences, colonialism, uh, reformation movements, modernity, technology. So for argument's sake, the printing press, when it really kicked in in India, uh, it was revolutionary because you could get information around so quickly. So I think when I asked you what Sikh art was, it was a bit of a trick question but equally it's interesting to see how these ideas are now developing because obviously in in today's time you could argue that there is a a seat art 
there is Sikh art, but the only thing that defines it being Sikh are the people making it or the subjects in the art, rather than the techniques, as you said. But I think this also has to do with um, the fact that Sikh history is so cosm what do you call that cosmological, uh, so multicultural. You can say in a way um, because. It's, it's Dogmatic dog, dogmaticism hasn't really been a part of Sikh history. So, I was going to say, like, wouldn't you argue though that, or like, even the so the idea of Maharaja Jit Singh Ji's empire being cosmopolitan and Maharaja Jit Singh Ji kind of being put on this pedestal of being this great compassionate leader? I'm not arguing he isn't, but like, if you read Janganama. I think it's Muhammad Shah wrote, wrote, wrote it. Um, he talks about how there isn't really this religious distinction between the people of the land and. Give me, yeah, exactly. That, that's that's the point I was trying to make. So, for instance, firstly, obviously, if you want to talk about it, we have to define it first. Otherwise, we can go on east, south, west, and north. But the, the, the issue or the beauty, I would say, in Sikh art is that it's so diverse and it's and I would say it in, includes a lot of different strands. So let me give you an example. The, the most obvious example would be to say Sikh art is something that depicts the gurus or something that's made by a Sikh, right? That's like the most logical explanation. But what if it's a Hindu who painted the gurus? Would that be considered Sikh art then? Or what if it's a Sikh who's painting a painting of Krishna? Would we still consider that Sikh yeah, art then? only because it, the, the, the subject is, is Sikh. Sikh. Um, and I think this is like where... I think the, the beauty of Sikhism or the beauty of Sikh art comes into play because it's so diverse because you have... Hindus that are patroning, uh, giving state funding to to paintings of the gurus, for instance, and we would still call that Sikh art, even though it's probably paid by Hindu. It's it's being painted by a Hindu as well, but it's it depicts a Sikh subject. And this is what I mean. Like it's it's so beautiful because we have all these different traditions coming in. So in the early, we can talk about this in the early chronology. A lot of the early paintings of the gurus they follow a kind of Sufi pattern. Then later on, the, the, the method becomes more of the Rajput kind of style. And then today we have more of the European. And we consider all of it Sikh art. And I think this is like the beauty that we don't restrict our minds into saying there's only one kind of Sikh art, but all of it is actually Sikh art. Yeah. Well, I think again though the definition still fits, which is if the subject or the paint or the artist is Sikh, quote unquote, that would fall into the remit of it being Sikh art. But equally, I think that that, that concept of Sikh art Although we know that it means something far deeper than like Sikh in a modern exclusive religious sense, I think the term itself kind of hides its deeper meaning, if you get what I mean. Because like from from the from just saying that the the term Sikh art, you, you you may assume X, Y, and Z, but actually the more you dig, it turns out that it's not distinctively Sikh, if that makes sense. It's just the fact that the subject happens to be a Sikh or or, or. and again, I think a lot of it is actually tightly attached to identity and, and how Sikhs identify. So for argument's sake, whenever people post images of the of the early Janam Saki image uh, images of Guru Anik Devji, and again traditionally wearing a silly topi, people you can see loads of people go bonkers. They're like, that's not Guru Anik Devji how dare you post this and you're like whoa chill that was the the image of Gunan Devji at that time equally you see in like paintings by Sobha Singh and again I think we touched upon this in our first podcast where we were like well what is authentic like and I guess seek seek art and it being authentic again I guess goes kind of hand in hand because a lot of the stuff that we hold to be great examples of seek art are like authentic pieces that have been made to show the community is at a particular point or a particular place so a lot of the the, the art from the Sikh empire is showcased because it goes to show how the Sikhs went from kind of suffering to genocides to then creating an, an empire but no it is definitely interesting and, and we could be here forever and ever just debating on the term C and then what that means by C car. But I think if we're fair, uh, we're all settled on the fact that C car in a modern sense is defined by either the subject or the artist being Sikh in some sense. All right. Well, at least we agree on something today. Just, just, just giving further examples then of, of of kind of art and architecture that is probably worth sharing. So a lot of the stuff that 
again, written by Western academics, seems to argue that a lot of Sikh art didn't really kind of come to fruition until early 19th century with the Sikh empire. When I dug a little bit into that, there was actually quite a lot of stuff. So obviously loads of art is created during Maharaj Haranjit Singh Ji's reign. He had goldsmiths and marble inlayers working on Harmanda Sahib. Again, I can't imagine all of those goldsmiths and inlayers were Sikh by any means. But again, we as a community, and again, Simran touched upon this earlier, we appropriate that being Sikh art because it's in Harmanda Sahib and that's a Gurdwara and therefore the art must be Sikh. But actually, I think, again, it, it relates to what Satnam was just saying, which is it, it also reflects that cosmopolitan, multicultural, the diversity within Sikhi, um, that, that it's obviously non-exclusive in that sense. So again, Patiala's Killa Mubarak is one of the most significant Sikh forts to have survived. Apparently, it's, it was founded in 1765, and I think it's now just rotting away because no one really seems to, to, to be bothered about it. Um, then just, just moving on into certain techniques. So I came across... Gach and Dukri work. The, again, just so happened to come across it because it was in relation to Harmanda Sahib. I just wanted to ask Simran if you knew anything more about that and like how that works. And again, you were talking about it earlier when you were uh, looking into the geometry of Harmanda Sahib. Um, like, could you just share some of that information? Um, specifically, just that that was the kind of stuff I was supposed to be learning um, now. From my masters but because of lockdown it's a bit and it's all gone in the bin a little bit but um as far as i know in terms of research and everything there were a lot of precious and semi-precious stones used within these kind of traditions and it's um again linking back i think what well, according to me with all these stones i always look back into how they relate to chakras and they relate to adornment and things that i don't think people look at now if that makes sense, if it's like Sikhs now, we kind of look away from adorning and from being able to celebrate and decorate and these very traditional methods, while very laborious and obviously created by not just Sikh artists, but a rate a plethora of different artists. I mean, most of them are probably Hindu. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what I was going I don't, I don't know too much about it. I mean, I read the same book that you did with um, uh, the Empire of Sikh uh, books and um, I kind of got an idea of the materials and how everything was very natural. It was all clay, mud, glass, they're very primal materials and that manifested into these beautiful decorations. No, fair. I think one thing that I came across, so in terms of like Sikh, Sikhi and traditional arts, the, the ones that I could kind of pen down were like, for argument's sake, Sakya. So everyone that I've spoken to some point somewhere they're like oh yeah my grandma or my granddad or someone somewhere told me this Saki and it, it sparked my interest in something and again it's an, it's an oral tradition gets passed down from generation to generation to be honest only until kind of modern historicity has this preoccupation with everything having to be referenced and evidenced oral tradition took center stage obviously now it's it's not necessarily accepted within the historical field as it once was um, but then again moving on and I think another example quite easy to, to illustrate is there's a great documentary on Amazon Prime. If no one's watched it, go and watch it. It will show to you how this traditional art was removed. I think they could have been a lot sterner about some of the stuff they said, but again, like it's a great effort. So, so no, uh, no criticisms towards them for that. But again, again, Rakitan, a traditional art gets passed down from generation to generation. Something though that I found interesting when reading about all of this traditional art stuff was that how it almost seemed to be banned or seemed to go underground when that host community was colonized. So for argument's sake, just giving you two quick analogies, the British passed a law in Punjab, I forgot the name of it now, but it basically made it illegal for people to carry shastas. And obviously you're banning Kutbans, you're banning the like the key ingredient to what makes a Singh a Singh, right? Or Khalsa, Khalsa, however you want to define it. Equally, Another example in Hawaii, when they ban traditional hula dancing and don't get this mixed up with the superficial Western notion that we have of it, it went underground because they had to keep the tradition alive. Now, why do you guys think that there is such a preoccupation with removing traditional arts within those indigenous communities? I think if you kind of look from a colonizer's perspective, to break a community and to be able to hold ultimate power of a, commun a community, you break their traditions. I think that's what gives them their, like a, a community, their individuality, and helps them to 
connect to who they are like you said the ancestors and everything that makes them who they like the community who they are so as soon as you get rid of that they're kind of lost trying to hold their footing then you're able to take power over them I think that was a that was kind of the the way that they kind they went about things and were able to dissolve all of what we knew about arts and crafts and poetry and all of these things I think yeah, that's yeah, that's true. I agree with that. Um, but I also think we have to look at the, both the push and the pull factors because, like, if now we're, we're talking about the colonial period, um, the, the, the Europeans brought with them a lot of new methods, new uh, oil paintings, and so forth, uh, which the Sikhs at, at the time the Sikh painters got inspired by, and they thought this is new. We've never tried this before. Let's let's try it out. And then they got fascinated with it. So on the other end, there's one thing where as you can say it was suppressed, trying to like trying to like a connection with the with the past but another one is basically i think a lot of sikhs actually found this to be very attractive this new, these new methods these new ways of of painting and um, this european style of painting portraiture and all that stuff so i think has we have to look at both angles here it's, it's not just something was taken and robbed away from us it's also that the sikhs wanted to try something new because the pahari way of painting for instance was was very old um and the Mughal way of painting was very old as well and you know like human nature is that you always want to try something new no completely and i don't i don't disagree with that for one second but i think there's a slight difference in so putting that to the side because i think that is a that's a bit of a gray area in in relation to this conversation but like for argument's sake i think an easy example would be to talk about sikh foundry so the sikh cannon factory that modern Dinjit singh set up in lahore in 1807 i think so he established a foundry to create cannons and other guns and whatever for for the sake of war in lahore now by only what like 20 years later in 1830 a british officer observed he had obviously gone to the foundry and he had seen the, the the quality of these guns and he had said that the guns were well cast and carriage is in good repair. They had been made in Lahore and cost him a thousand rupees each. Now, I don't know how much that was back then. Obviously, it was a, an, ext- like an extraordinary amount. But what that goes to illustrate is, is that there are techniques and methods f- within the indigenous communities that do hold up to the methods and the techniques of the colonizing community. And actually, the imbalance of power almost ensures that the host community communities like technology is washed away with so giving you another example there's a there's quite a, a common debate that takes place nowadays which is about how certain kitanis use like bollywood tunes to drop their kitan tracks on and i think that's a very easy way of putting into an uh, an example how we've taken a traditional art form or it was a traditional art form at least our kitan and, and i guess still is but they've hybridized it with modernity it's now turned into like i don't know like bollywood kitan almost so like i don't disagree with what you're saying that there's obviously some type of like obviously humans wish like they everyone wants to kind of develop and move forward and i think that's probably why the art example isn't necessary doesn't necessarily like work in that sense I, but equally i guess that's what gives people for argument's sake like like simran and others who are bringing back these old they're not bringing them back because obviously people like people know them if you guys are learning them if that makes sense but as in like you're reviving it within the seek space I, like besides i think jatinder and yourself and and obviously some of the people involved with the mahala nine calendar like I, i've never really been aware of traditional arts in the seek space i've been aware of people kind of using modern art and, and recreating seek imagery or whatever and then obviously everyone's familiar with people like some Bussing, etc., who have probably defined an entire generation. Because again, there's always that debate about Gunani Devji looking quite looking quite chubby, to say the least. And you're just like, well, if he went on all of these audaces and walked everywhere, Gunani Devji would have been really lean. Like imagine walking, like if you look at the, the audaces and the maps that Gunani Devji walked, I get tired just looking at it. So like imagine, mm-hmm. like imagine the the body of the person who had who had who had like who had walked that. And I think again, I guess this opens up a conversation which is like when like when does authenticity matter or does it matter like does the artist have a responsibility to reflect the subject in an as historical honest manner as possible or is that just me with my history hat on being a nerd i think it's important to be able to represent figure especially like when you're looking at the gurus and everything and how back in like you've got the paintings of granite Devji with their like it's, it's a very different kind of outlook on what we see as granite Devji now like everyone's got the like you said the one sort of busing photo in the house and that's what we've grown up thinking Maj looks like and then when we see all these different paintings it 
you're able to understand the gurus in a different way as well. Like, I think even contemporary artists now, like Jitinder, for example, he painted a painting Guru Gobind Singh Ji during Amrit Gala doing Gitan with their Singhs and um, all, everyone around them. And I think that was a very important, like, although it wasn't the traditional way of looking at Guru Gobind Singh Ji and the way they looked, just that that kind of context and be able to see the gurus in a different sense creates this whole rounded image of what you'd imagine the gurus to be like. I mean, I feel like it would, instead of having Marge so far away and putting Marge on a big pedestal, be able to relate to the gurus more. So just going back to your original question, I, th I think like sh should the uh, should the paintings depict the gurus as historically correct? I think we need to separate what is art and what is a portraiture. Like if you're trying to create a portrait and you're saying this is a portrait, then obviously I would say it has to be historically correct because you're going through a specific genre here. But if you're saying this is art, then I don't think you have to be historically correct because now you're talking about imagination and emotion and devotion and so forth. Yeah, very good point. That's a very good point. And I think actually that helps understand this a lot better because then if you view that as art, it actually doesn't matter so to speak just before we go into a bit more detail about like how representation within Sikh art matters I just want to push the boundary a little bit so you're saying it doesn't necessarily matter when it comes to like art and imagination but obviously there's got to be some line that's drawn somewhere so for argument's sake, give you another example. And again, I guess, again, art is subjective, so we could be here forever. Um, on Twitter, someone, and again, uh, what I assume is a Sikh artist, uh, simply because they had a Sikh Twitter handle and they were posting Sikh art, but imagery of Gurgaumi Singhji, um, they had essentially replaced, uh, there was an image of Gurgaumi Singhji and they had essentially replaced Gurgaumi Singhji's face with a skull. And it had created a huge Twitter storm. People were like, how dare you? Personally speaking, I can see where both sides of the spectrum are coming from. I probably wouldn't have posted it if I was him. Could have, like I would have seen the the Twitter storm that came with it. But surely there's got to be some responsibility as an artist for what it is that you're producing. I haven't I haven't seen what you're talking about here, so I can't I can I don't know what it looked like. And a lot of the examples you give are like from Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. It sounds like a lot of extreme stuff is happening there. I mean, most Sikh artists like Simon, they're not doing this kind of stuff. So I think the discussion should also be centered around what are Sikh artists doing and not the fringe artists, you can say, because a majority are not even involved in making these skulls and whatever you said. Um so I think like the discussion on Sikh art should also be based on what is the majority of painters doing and not like the shit stones you see on Twitter or, or else well because um, I, I think that's giving them too much attention anyway no no that i don't disagree with and obviously like the reason we're having the the podcast with simon is because these people like someone take center stage when we are talking about seek art that that's like not not question but when you're saying that like i'm just being devil's advocate and pushing the envelope when we're talking about if seek art or art in itself is left to your imagination and portraiture is what is meant to kind of depict a reality like how far do you take like like at what point are you like well i'm just trying to demarcate like how far can you take that oh i'm being devil's advocate and asking you to define that actually I was going to I was just going to say like in terms of your question before I sit here and judge whether this is art or not I would actually just ask the artist what what's the reasoning for for creating this particular image because if he has some sort of political or social message behind that painting then maybe the painting would start to make more sense um, and then all of a sudden it, it could be considered art. Uh, but if you don't get that context in it it looks like a insult or like you're trying to uh, storm and insult people by by purpose so it, it also has to do you know was talking about the process of it like the, the context of it the humility that goes into it and the spirituality but also the the, the social context what's the point if he, he or she claims that this is art he or she must have some sort of little message behind it uh in order to create this shock value and then maybe on the basis of that i would say okay it makes sense. Now I can understand why you created it in such a horrifying uh, way. Um, but one thing is whether this is art or not. Another is, is it good art or is it bad art? That's another discussion. No, I really, really like that response. I think that's a brilliant way of putting it together. And I think actually in you saying, like in, in relation to the point of you saying it's about the shock value, I think what you've also touched upon is actually there's an intention from the artist I guess with the world and the way everything's going now and how everything's moving away from traditional art, the, contem the contemporary form of art comes through and contemporary art works a lot on shock value. 
So to grab people in, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily skill and understanding all of these processes and things. It's that one thing that shocks you straight away and you're like, wait, I want to know more kind of. So I feel like that's what contemporary work works on now. And a lot of, I, I mean, I know I know what painting, I know what you're talking about, Zena on Twitter. And it was like that reeled in a load of people, opened up loads of discussions and gave a lot of attention to something that may not should have shouldn't have really had much attention to be honest but I think it's working on shock value and making people sit there and question so many things that we are known to know for for ages and ages I mean that's that's where I kind of go with that really we're in a like a what is it we're we're going down like the rabbit hole so to speak in Alice in Wonderland because to be fair like what is art such a philosophical question like we could be here forever and ever like we can have a series of podcasts just discussing that um and then again just your question of like what's good and bad art again we could be here forever because obviously subjectivity like we could be here for days and days and days subjectivity relativism beauty and the higher the beholder the intention of the artist all of the other stuff I think your point's right but equally I think it's interesting that you say ask the artist because i think the only thing that i would add to that and uh, in relation to also what some of them are saying about the shock value is is that if that like that, that shock value within the art has to come from like you have to be aware of what's going to create shock like you need to be aware of the sensitivities of whatever community it is you're trying to tap into to be able to shock them if that makes sense um, and I think perhaps, again, that relates back to what Simran was saying earlier, which is a lot of traditional art is focused on process, the humility and everything that goes with it. And I think instinctively by approaching the art humbly, I, don't, I just think in, you're not going to set yourself up to try and shock someone. It's just not the intention. We look at the history of how uh, because we haven't touched upon, upon that but i think like let's just talk about the history a little bit like how did seek art come about how did it develop it is grounded within the genom saki tradition so Sikhi is essentially a religion that centers around the word the word of the gurus and not around the images of the guru but as the Sikh community were starting to tell stories about guru nanak and his exploits in the world and all these travels uh an artistic and developed um, and this artistic tradition was was put into the uh, Janam Saki stories. So they're depicting Guru Nanak traveling all over the world, talking to different people, so that they're like an add-on to, to this oral tradition that you were talking about earlier. Essentially, the paintings are there to invoke devotion. They're there to to create love uh, in, in the hearts of the readers and the listeners. And, and obviously, for our sake, a lot of these manuscripts or sorry a lot of these paintings which we, today we would classify as miniature paintings they were kept in manuscript uh, of these genom sakis and which is good for us because it means that they were kept safe from bugs from moist from sun damage and so forth this is really important because it means that they're still with us uh, today and if you look at it, any art historian will say well they're quite simple it's it's folk art it's popular art but also a lot of people agree that they're extremely beautiful because these are like some of the earliest expressions that we have of the gurus and i think the earliest example that we have to Day is from the time of Guru Harai eh, Maharaj. Uh, I, I think the earliest is dated at 1658. Um, and this is a Janam Saki book that has about 29 paintings in it uh, of the Guru, of Guru Nanak primarily. And then the next one that is with us today is, is, is roughly about 60 years later. It carries 42 paintings. And then the next one in line is 10 years later, 1733, and it has about 57. And the reason I'm name dropping these years is because it essentially shows that before the year 1733, there was a total of at minimum 128 paintings of the gurus. So there, there is from the time of the gurus, there is a, an artistic tradition that's being developed. And um, recent research by Biara Singh also um, shows that in the time of Guru Gobind Singh Ji, paintings were being commissioned by the gurus themselves. So, so, and we we're talking about portraits before. So, so the prime tr Sikh tradition of, of of art is is through through the, the manuscript tradition. They all mostly come inside a manuscript, like written texts. But then there's like a one-off by Baba Ram Rai, who was the son of Guru Har Rai, but he was later on exiled. Um, but when he created his own Gurudwara around Dera 
Uh, he, he had about, I think it was like 20 paintings done. And these were like a form of portraits of the gurus. And these are not, from what I've uh, understood, these are not in a manuscript. These are like paintings that are made to be like placed on a wall, so to speak. Uh, but this is like a one-off. We, we don't really see that in, 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 in the days, in the, in the, in the early um, paintings and artistic tradition of this. Uh, by then, it is something that accompanies the word because the Sikh tradition is, is, a, is, is a religion that centers around words and not around images. We can also see that early on that uh, there is a there is a ethos, so there's like a huge respect given to painters and the skill that they they provide. So recently on my Instagram, I put up this quote from the Brahms It says, and this is a book that was written in the Anandpur Darbar, that basically says that paint any Sikh ruler, he should be surrounded uh, by painters and he should give them state funding. Here you see that painters are also being put into the political sphere of a Sikh state or a Sikh, a Sikh kingdom, you can say. And, and maybe perhaps we can see that this was already in place at the time of Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj, because there is an early Dasam Granth Sarup from the time of the Guru and that actually contains two images of the Guru um, in a very regal style that is very different from, from the earlier paintings uh, that we have of Guru Nanak which mostly portrays him like this very pious Sufi. And these two paintings of Guru Gobind Singh uh, describes him as a king, portrays him as a king in a very regal manner. No, fair. Just two things that I wanted to touch upon, and I think this will probably form quite a, an interesting little discussion amongst us. And we've kind of touched upon it as we've been going through this con through this discussion without actually kind of saying it, which is, does representation within traditional art matter? I think there's guidelines that you follow. I mean, I feel like that's something that's important within every tradition. There's things that you have to follow. Like, on, like there's history that's there that kind of defines what mind looks like or gives that kind of brief outline. And then it opens up. And I think that's affected by how much the world is developing and what we see as divine inspiration now. I think everyone's got, their, like artists as well, they've all got their view of God as something different or their view of the gurus as something different. I mean, some people say that, like you said, the Sobasing painting is very accurate or some people go back and look at all the Janam Sakis and say those are also very accurate. So I think it, it depends on on the artist as well, but there are guidelines that are placed that, that, that need to be there for everything else to develop. I mean, you can see it in artists now a lot of artists it's not traditional Bahari painting you, you can see it in the way I mean I, I was able to kind of figure out new paintings now through um, obviously learning and understanding that they're not miniatures they're at all I, I, I used to think they were and they're not but um, they followed gu guidelines that make them look like very traditional paintings, but they've got very contemporary context. So like the one of Jadin there and like being able to create these intimate scenes of the gurus that kind of take you back into that world and understand what life was like then. Don't you also think, though, that the... So not necessarily talking about past Sikh art, but kind of Sikh art moving forward, again, however you wish to define that. But um, doesn't representation also matter in terms of helping to create or helping? I, like, so first of all, I understand, obviously, that art reflects where the person or the artist is coming from, their host community or the rest of it. But equally, the art serves a purpose or kind of sends a message. So for argument's sake, a lot of Sikh art within, say, the time of the Janam Saki tradition, is completely focused on Guru Nanak Dev Ji, Mardana, um, and their journeys and kind of, and, and almost telling stories in a picture. And, and that obviously serves a purpose for that time period and whatever. And, and we value it as historians because of that purpose that it fulfilled. Equally, if you look at Sikh art during the time of Maharaj and Jeet Singh Ji's empire, just give you a list of some of the things or just name a few of the things that ended up in the Toshkana of Harmandha Sahib, thanks to Ranjit Singh and his family. There was a set of armor mail, a helmet belonging to Maharaj Sher Singh. It was manufactured in a place nearby and it was polished and repaired in Lahore. There was also a shield that was inlaid in Delhi and purchased from a merchant of the same place. Then there was a quiver made to order um, and the same thing for a powder horn and they were ordered on the occasion of Karik Singh's wedding and and that's just a few of again I know that's focused on weapons but again it's just a few of the things that I found listed but again they seem to serve or well they serve a purpose for the community at the time if that makes sense so equally do you think it's important for Sikh artists again quote unquote in this modern era like well today in today's age to like where is that balance between obviously respecting kind of the past and traditions and and, and kind of traditional depictions and then reimagining certain representations so for argument's sake Jatinda's image is a, is a great example 
Well, I think again, it depends on the intention of the of the of the painter. So, if the painter wishes to to change something in the world, you can do that through art. Uh, there's a lot of like very iconic pictures. Uh, just so much photography. There's a lot of iconic pictures from uh, the Vietnam War that that basically turned the tides and made everyone go against the American aggression in Vietnam and suddenly they had to withdraw. And this is art changing history, right? So, if the is the in terms of representation, if you're trying to change the way we perceive things in the past. A good way to do that is is through art. For instance, I always wonder, I think we talked about this in the last podcast as well, I always wonder why Gurdjieff Singh is always depicted as a warrior when we know that 25 years of their life was in pursuance of scholarly ambitions. All the stuff I talk about on my Instagram, um, all these books that are being brought to Anandpur, all these hundreds of scholars, uh, all these philosophical debates that are taking place in Anandpur. Like you, you get the feeling this is Anandpur is not just a city of warriors, is a very vibrant city. Culture is being created here, and so forth. None of this can be seen in the paintings in, in, in our that have come down to us. It's always the guru as a warrior. So Simran, for instance, I encourage you to do this. But if you were to create a line of let's say ten different paintings in the next couple of years, depicting the guru as a as a scholar, as a poet, as a writer, and so forth. I think in 50 years the whole image of the guru will be changed because people will start seeing this representation rather than solely the warrior representation. I don't know if that answered your question. That's how I understood it. No, I know. I really think that's a great. But this this is the brilliance of these podcasts because we have these discussions. These questions come up, and these different perspectives are how we're like. I think we're going to like help in analogy to what you're saying, like construct or help construct how we as a community can present ourselves and and just then bringing it back to the traditional art scene um in the mahala nine calendar i've forgotten the artist's name again let me know if, if you're aware he painted a young guru Teg Bhadaji on a horse and i just thought that like i've never seen any painting like that before i've never seen any representation of that before and it just completely changes perspective or your understanding of the guru because what that reminded me of was how guru Teg Bhadaji earned the name because that literally means like great warrior, someone who can wield a dick. And so it just changes completely your your understanding. So Sanam's also right though, in relation to Simran, if you paint loads of remorse on paintings, which you are, it's going to literally change how the community views or understands themselves. Just kind of wrapping it up, so to speak, where do you think the importance of traditional art and Sikhi lies? Like, do you think we should be preoccupied with bringing back this traditional art? So for argument's sake, like Rakitan is a really easy example. Well, this is actually a topic where I've changed my mind over the years. So if you asked me this question, or if, you, uh, if we had this podcast five years ago, I was quite dogmatic at the time. I was like, the only form of that's acceptable, the only form of painting is the traditional ones, the only form of is blah, blah, blah. Um, but over the years, I've actually gotten to appreciate a lot of the modern stuff as well. Because again, what we call Puratan today, the old ancient uh, traditional ones, that was new back then. So like just um, appropriating the Pahari way of, um, of of painting the gurus, for instance, that was a very new thing that they hadn't done in 200 years. So that was like an innovation in the same way as, but today we call it old old, old school, right? Um, and a lot of the paintings that Sobhasing will be doing in three, 500 years from now, that will be considered old school paintings. All this time, like you said, like Akal, the word like every, what is time anyway? It's just a construct we created, right? Oh, sorry, Kal, uh, time is just a construct we created. So over the years, I've actually gotten to appreciate modern art uh, quite a lot. I've basically just opened up so i think as a community going forward i think we need to have people that are specializing like simran does in the traditional art forms but we also need people that are specializing in, in new ways innovative ways new ways of doing things that are coming from america from africa from asia whatever and basically appropriating those because i think like seaguard is such a rich we have such a rich heritage I also think we shouldn't just keep it as a as a museum heritage we should also be employing new new things so we're creating art for the future as well if that makes sense because if, if if we just if we just do everything the way it was 200 years ago, it basically just means we're doing everything the way it was 200 years ago. And and as a community, is that what we want to do? I, th- I think it has this up and down. Me personally, where I am now in my life, I might change in five years, but I think the more to the better. No, I couldn't disagree because to be quite honest, had people 
had people like Saul Bossing not painted their images, we wouldn't be having certain conversations we are having today. Like, and, and I think fortunately I did a history degree and I didn't do a history of art degree, which would be completely boring, but I had some friends who did it. And it'd be really interesting to, to actually talk to someone who who perhaps has done a um, history of art degree just looking at Sikh history because I'd love to, to understand what narrative they come with, if anything, considering how kind of sparse it is. But yeah, I guess equally though, we have to respect the traditions but equally move with the time and there are as as simmons also said earlier on there are certain kind of frameworks that you work within um to ensure obviously you like you're you're not being offensive or, or whatever it might be bringing that same question then to you simran and again just equally to wrap up in terms of just concluding like where do you think obviously traditional art is important to you because you wouldn't be doing a master's in it otherwise but just in relation to seek art where do you see it all going and like what are your opinions then on terms of where Sikh artists should be looking? Should it kind of be more traditional? As Satnam said, there are obviously pros and cons to both, but would love to hear from your perspective. I definitely say that I'd love to see a lot more artists picking up traditions. I think that's a big thing because right now I feel like there's only about maybe four or five within the Sikh community that do actually work traditionally like traditionally traditionally but i do agree with Sadnam in the way that there should be a plethora of different artists and different forms of work because um like back it back in the day that was what was available everyone knew um, about pahari painting everyone knew but that was the norm then the norm now is that we have all these different types of work and types of ways of working and craft and these are going to tell the stories of what we have now so when people look back at us in like 100 years 200 years they'll know that this was what was available then this will be our tradition so it is about having that kind of balance between both so you don't lose what was once there but then you don't also go and stomp your feet on what's being created now an analogy perhaps to make and again correct me if you don't think this fits but i guess it's like we still need to respect rakit and keep that tradition alive but if you were to play a new instrument within rag that's fine so you're you're taking the new kind of and I know it's it's just moving the artistic kind of perspective from kind of painting etc to to music in a similar sense it's kind of like there's new techniques etc like yeah there's no, we're not like shunning them or saying don't look at them but they have their place in balance to tradition um, and traditional art and all the benefits and the pros that come with that because I think the stuff like you touched upon about humility its connection to kind of like a deeper connection to God and creation and everything that else goes with it I just that is obviously not there with a lot of contemporary art techniques just one last question that uh, a community someone who follows the, the page sent in um they asked why do traditional art, why i guess it, this is also kind of answered by the fact that it's what is available to the people at the time but why are traditional arts so preoccupied with natural materials like, like you said i think it was availability but um it's been like that for years and like caveman paintings all created by a, a very ancient palette that was um used from different earths and different um things resources that they could find and i think most of it is about availability but it's also about the processes that were created in natural pigments it's it's being able to connect to the earth and something that is um very it's, it's something that we don't we take take for granted i mean we all sit here in a city everything's paved over with concrete ground but underneath all of that there's a color that comes out of the earth that people initially years ago um used to paint and it's just kind of getting back into his roots like there's a transference of energy i learned this through another persian teacher that i learned and she talked about how she grinded she bought this pigment no she bought this bark from a a tree in a museum and it was a jurassic tree and she grinded it up and created a pigment out of it and she painted the tree of life with it and it was this transfer of energy constantly throughout the whole piece so you're taking everything that comes from natural grounds that you don't have control over you don't know when it was touched you don't know how long it's been underground and you transfer it into a painting that's now there for the whole world to see it's is is it, it blows your mind? It really does. But I I think that was a big reason as to why people use natural pigments, and then obviously availability as well. Because now I think because of the industrial revolution, everything's panned out with different machines being able to do things, and all of these different synthetic colors coming out. But there's a beauty about natural pigments that you can't get at all from synthetic uh, from synthetic um, paints. I think that is an absolutely brilliant way to uh, wrap that up. I wouldn't disagree with you that it blows your mind because just having this conversation with you, I've had a brilliant time. I've enjoyed this thoroughly. 
I have to say thank you both Simran and Satnam for the discussion today and thank you to those who have listened and made it to the end of episode 7 of the Sorge podcast. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and if you want to support us you can do so via patreon.com forward slash ramblings of a seek.